Well, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Annabel Mead. I'm from Minerva. Um, we um, do the, the communications for CombiBiz. Um, we're very pleased to welcome you here this afternoon. Um, and I'm very pleased to introduce um, Carl Ritz. Um, now Carl is a professor of soil biology at the University of Nottingham. Um, he is a soil ecologist and a passionate researcher. Um, he, um, he described himself as convinced that soil is the most remarkable and complex and um, fascinating material on the planet. And it's this in-depth study of the soil in the past sort of 40 years that's led him to being a more of a, and he describes himself as an accidental photographer, but it's looking at the complexities of the soil that has led him to um, uh, be so good at his photography and be able to communicate it to the outside world. So very many thanks, Carl, for joining us, and uh, it's over to you. Well, thanks very much, and um, <clears throat> good afternoon, or whatever time of day it is, wherever you are. And uh, thank you for the for the introduction. Um, so what I wanted to do, what Minerva asked me to do, is give you some sort of insights into uh, image making for scientific photography. So I've had a little wordplay there, imagining for scientific photography. Um, so what we're going to do, the, the aims of what I want to try and achieve with you this afternoon is to provide some advice and guidance on what makes effective and striking photographic images for use in science communication. And of course, these are personal perspectives. So you know, there are no rules here, nothing's right and wrong, but here's some perspectives for you. And very happy to to pick up if you pick up my ideas or to chat about them now or in the future. So I, I've, as well as an avid scientist, ecologist, and researcher, I'm also um, very keen on photography. Um, been taking photos for over 40 years now, mainly for personal pleasure. But of course, on occasion, the day job as a soil scientist also demands that. And as in the introduction, these there is a crossover here be between these things. Um, <clears throat> Be about 20 minutes or so, and lots of time for questions and things afterwards, um, however you like to, to, to run that. So it's all about seeing and thinking and connecting those things together. So let's just really put the, the key points across right in the beginning, and then we'll look at some nice images. So we'll start with some, some plain, boring words. But the, the key here is in terms of imagining for scientific photography. Here, bear in mind also I'm talking about photographs using visible light, so i.e. camera type systems. There's a whole other story about imaging using other sorts of um, systems such as x-rays, etc., which is a talk for another day. So in this particular context of sort of scientific photography, of course the key thing about an effective image is that it puts across scientific information. <clears throat> and as scientists we want to be objective and therefore you might want to use the catchphrase that's sometimes used for the advertising protecting agency where they're talking about advertisements. They need to be legal, decent, honest and truthful. And I would argue in many ways that's the same for science but perhaps in the reverse order because often we're a little less worried about the legality as opposed to the truthfulness of what we see. There's a whole deep philosophical discussion there about you know what, what is truth in an image. Again, we haven't got time for that today. But the other twist here really is that of course we also, especially for science communication, seek them to be visually appealing. They need to look good, they need to be striking so that people look at them and then look into them. So what you need here is something that's compositionally good and of course also technically very strong. And this is where the art and science of photography uh, sort, of, sort of come together. And the other thing that you always need to bear in mind when you're starting to compose or think about your images is that they need ideally to reveal the context or the theme or the narrative of where you're going to use them. <clears throat> so a really effective image works on a number of levels. First of all, it looks cool. Secondly, it conveys some information, but it also then starts to connect this wider perspective and wider, wider context. And for example, in a photographic competition, where the image is going to be standing completely on its own, out of context of somebody talking about it or in the middle of a talk, then it, you need to think much more carefully about that sort of context than if you're just using it as a, as a filler or, or a background in, in your talk. And I think there's also a, comp there's a competition background to the, the reason we're giving this webinar as well. So here's, again, some ideas, hopefully, that you could, you could pick up to use in that sort of context. 
So things to think through in terms of any image in any context, as I've just rehearsed there, is, is that actual context, the purpose, what's it for? Is it for a scientific talk? Is it for a paper? Is it for a competition or whatever else? And of course, as goes with any scientific communication, the audience. Is this going to be for a specialised audience or a general one? And that, you know, people from different backgrounds or different audiences will be attracted to images in different sorts of ways, depending on who they are. And if you have the luxury of actually prescribing your image from the outset for a particular context, then that all works. But of course, in your day job as scientists or whatever, or as photographers or whatever else, there are very often be circumstances where you don't know that. So you also need to have that ability or that knack to take images that might be universal and can be used in all sorts of different contexts. The other key thing in um, scientific photography is that of scale. So generally speaking, one wants to always be able to inform what the size of the objects you're looking at are. And this is especially the case in my sort of area where I look at soils across all sorts of different scales. Some of the images are quite abstract. It's unclear what that is. So you can, there are ways of, different ways of doing that, and um, again I'll give you some examples, but equally the scientific, the, the hardcore scientific approach to this is to put a scale bar into the image, and that's the golden rule. Any image going into a scientific publication, or generally on screen, there should be a scale bar there, because that, that conveys that critical information. And again, there are, I can give you some hints and tricks on to how to handle being able to record the scale in the image you're taking so you can use it in the future and in, that, in that sort of context. Okay, so those are all the boring black and white words. Let's get on to really what the theme of the, the, the session is all about, which is some images. So um, I'm going to give you some examples to start with of some of my personal stock images, which can be used in all sorts of contexts. So a stock image is something that sits in your, on your hard drive these days, and you can pull it out and use it under all sorts of different circumstances. So here's an example of one of my stock images of a landscape. This is a nice multifunctional image because I can use it for all sorts of diverse land use or soil, water, atmosphere, stories, and backdrops. Notice it's got some nice horizontal zoning, so that can, be, that can be used as well. And with careful cropping, this can then be very effective for a slide feature. So I could use it just as a general nice picture like, like this, or I could crop out those sheep or whatever and use it as a sidebar for a typical starter slide for a presentation where I might want to be talking about landscape scale processes, blah, blah, blah. And you see from that stock image, I've been able with careful cropping to pull out a feature there that actually is visually appealing but it also picks up the themes of those bullets there and what this presentation would be all about. So we get a good library of those in your, in your system and you'll be well versed for these sorts of, these sorts of circumstances. Here's another example um, of, of course, my, you know, as a soil scientist, so here are soils and plants together. And in this case, we have an obvious scale because there's a tree there or there's some plough furrows or whatever else. And I have a whole load of these. These are some examples of my stock ones, but notice, Again, visually carefully composed so that we have some nice parallel lines, horizontal stripes, etc., etc. Um, there. And I'm going to use these in a minute to give you an example of how these sorts of stock images can be melded to create a composite image that puts across a key concept um, in, in, in that. Here's an example of it's rather now rather more abstract, of course. This is a soil surface, and there's some bits of straw there in the middle at the top. Um, put this in an example again to provide you with something that's sort of amorphous, but there's a little bit of there's a feature of interest there, which is that little piece of straw at about um, 10 o'clock. And on the right hand side, there's the old trick, the old photographer's trick of using a coin to put a scale bar in there. Now, this, is, this can be tricky because coins are quite shiny, so they tend to reflect, but at least it does serve, a, you know, I know that's a, a UK five pence piece, I can measure that. So I can use that to scale the image. I can either crop it out. Um, in, if, I, if I wanted to, or I could leave it in, again, depending on the context and or the audience. And so far, these images have been taken with a, with a standard camera, standard lenses, etc. Also, we need to move into the context of um, photo, like macro photography, um, which will be applicable to many of you if, you, if you're biologists or whatever else. And so here we're now you know, increasing the magnification of images um, markedly. I've not put a scale bar on this one just to, to prove that I can't be perfect every time, but we'll come back to that. So with macro photography, lots of opportunity for abstract forms and they can be made visually appealing by careful composition. So here we have some plant roots 
and some fungal hyphae or fungal threads connecting them. And the scale here is unclear, so you'd need a bar there for scientific audiences, or not if you just want to make an impact. And here I just want to make an impact. Um, again, notice the composition, some nice horizontal lines here with some vertical threads going through, and those diagonals all help to keep the thing focused as opposed to just being a, a random slew of, of lines. Um, I took this picture back in 1982 during my PhD, and I still use it in many talks. Proof of put it, proof of you know, including today. So again, remember stuff that you're taking you know, even early in your career, whatever, else can really, really serve you well um, over over the years. And then here's another example of um, this is some work I did a few years ago where I was embedding soil in resin and making thin sections in order to look at how the soil structure was organised. Um, so here we have a, a block of soil that's been embedded in resin and then cut and polished. Now this is very, very abstract and this starts to get scientifically quite, you know, quite deep and complex. And this time I put a scale bar in to give you an example of how, again, the scale bar can be placed so that it shows up um, strikingly on the screen. But even though this is all very abstract and very scientific, there's a very deliberate composition here to make it visually appealing in the sense that there's that feature of the charcoal in the lower right and it's offset and it's aligned to the center. So that feature draws the eyes into the center of the image. So when someone looks at this, subliminally, they're being drawn into that image and I can then use that to carry you into all the sub-stories that are going on in there. And um, if we had time, which we don't have today. So example then of those few images I've shown you um, of, the, of the fields and then the soil surface, et cetera, et cetera. There's some examples of what, you know, you could think about stock images, but if you, I can take them and I can cut sections out of them and put them together to create a composite from those previous ones to put across a key theme in soil science that, that we all have to work with, which is that of spatial scale. So here are solar systems across four orders of spatial magnitude. The first one doesn't need a scale bar because that's familiar because there's a tree there. And then the others, I put the scale bar in. But here I put the bars at the bottom, so again I can cut them off if needed, depending on the, 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 the context um, of that. And again, this composite image that I've put together, I've used time and time again um, in all sorts of places. It's been used in a variety of publications, both by myself and other people have used it. Notice how I've cropped those images to pick up features that make the whole, the whole thing still work. Um, also, um, on the, the tree image, you might notice that I've actually flipped it around. So what was left and right on the original image, which was reality in Scotland, has now been twisted around. And there you go, there's a philosophical issue of, you know, I've been image manipulating there. So it's an example of, of editing. And should I really have done that in the sense of being legal, decent, honest and truthful? Well, I'll leave, leave you to, dis to decide that one. Um, same trick can be used in a different context. So, you know, just take away that last image and you can use these sorts of panels in all sorts of different ways. Stick the scale bars right in there, etc., etc. So there's an example of how stock images can be used as they as stand on their own, but also you can then pull them in um, and, and composite and have and, and they can serve all sorts of, of functions depending on your context. So here's another, another example of just, just a nice image um, for you of a, of, of a stock again showing soils, but compositionally I like this. I think this works again because of the way those parallel lines are moving across into the back of the landscape. And again, this gives me an opportunity to talk of all sorts of things such as you know, soil management or you know, uh, tilled soils where we see the bare soil with the background, there's the green, and the, the soil is, is underneath that vegetation, etc. You know, do you think this field might be prone to erosion if there's a very heavy rainstorm, etc., etc.? But always visually appealing. And again, you know, there are no hard and fast rules about that, but it's a question of personal taste and developing your own style, etc., etc. Here's another one of Tractor uh, actually creating that field. Um, so this is the image as I first took it, and here's an example again of just looking at something and thinking as a photographer and thinking in compositional terms. The, it's, it, it's all very nice and technically good and so forth, but I think the Tractor is too central here. You generally want to avoid sticking things right in the middle of an image because that, um, that, that doesn't balance quite so well. So, Looking at that and just doing the standard photographer's eye of cropping, I think that I could stick a crop line around this image like this and stick, put the, the tractor down um, into the lower corner so that when we look at the cropped version, 
that's the aesthetic a little bit more pleasing because it's been offset slightly and again that works offsetting things also allows you the opportunity to give you a bit of space if you want to for example on this top left corner here to stick some other sub images or words or whatever else um, on, on that now here's a um, here's a another macro photograph this is a, a myxomycete which is a, a form of protozoa that live in live in many soils these are quite amazing organisms that um, that um, have a strange lifestyle and do all sorts of really weird things out there again um, uses a lot in public engagement talks because the the, the story about these these mix of my seats in, in woodlands is, is, is really cool but what I'm going to show you is three photos here to develop the story around this which is actually one about about scale again so this image, I think, is showing you the, the, the basic form of this organism called the myxomycete in the Scottish woodland. It doesn't need a scale bar because the leaf helps you with that. The leaf and the moss gives you that. You, you can see that. Now, in the soil, in the woodland, this organism lives as tens of millions of tiny little naked cells that move around in the soil water. And when certain conditions arise environmentally, in terms of temperature or day length and things like this, all these individual cells come together and form this big blob of, of cytoplasm or goo that comes out of the soil surface. So it emerges as a thing we call a plasmodium. And this is an example of the plasmodium that's come out of that soil litter layer and is busy aggregating around this leaf. Um, again, so carefully composed, striking image, nice, you know, technically, technically very high, but it's only part of the story because these plasmodia can grow to absolutely huge sizes. So in the next image, here is the original leaf on the top left corner, and on the other, on the other side now is the, a, a neighbouring tree trunk, which is still part of the same organism. So we've just caught the a little corner of that whole plasmodium. The rest of it is busy crawling up this tree trunk. So it's absolutely huge, great thing. So again, I show you a close-up to start with, and then sort of step back to show you the to show you the the, the, the mix of mice crawling up that tree. And here I use the other photographer's trick of putting my lens cap in there to give a sense of scale. But beware, that doesn't quite work. Also, of course, because lens caps, when they're branded, that could be quite a small lens cap, or it could come from a very large lens, and therefore it could actually you know, that would mess that up. However, by knowing what the size of that is, I can then come and put in a five-centimeter scale bar there. So you can see actually this thing is about, you know, when all comes together, it's about half a meter um, in size there. So again, put the lens cap in when you take the picture, you can then crop in um, a scale bar for, 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 for later stories if, if needed or whatever else. And again, by using this inset, I can show you the two scales and build that scaling story. Okay, so here, the next one I want to show you is an example of um, an image I created specifically for a talk. Um, where at a particular point in the talk I wanted to make a real impact around the concept of being able to use plants to manage soil systems. So here we have a wheat grain and the, the concept here is that you can start thinking about this as just the, the seed there is the starting package that will grow into this whole plant that will then be able to grow in the soil and affect the whole system etc etc as well as produce um, wheat grains and so on and so forth. But what I did here was I wanted to, to break all the all the words and things I was using before and just put up a nice clean image that was visually attractive so it would just grab the attention so I could then use that to pick up that theme um, with the with the audience subsequently. But then that background can also be used as a canvas for other images and words etc etc in the presentation and um, or not you could just use it like this to put that break on it looks great the audience will be concentrating and then you can pull them back into a whole load of, of word stuff or graphs or whatever else after that. Um, you again notice, you know, if I just stuck the grain in the middle of the screen, it wouldn't have worked quite so well as being offset like that. I do tend to offset things bottom right, which is probably just the way I am. Of course, there's no real reason as to why that needs, needs necessarily to be the case. So here's another example, um, again, specifically created for a talk just to provide a focal point about uh, mixed species cover crops in, in agriculture. This again is designed to be an arresting image by virtue of its high definition and quite a limited color palette. So it's just all those lovely golds and bronzes or whatever else. 
but there's a few black seeds in there again. They're kept away from the dead center just to avoid having a super central focal point because when you look at this, I want you to be just sort of picking up the whole general image and not focusing on one particular um, feature. I have a particular fondness and research interest in fungi, uh, mushrooms, so I have to show you some, um, some, some mushrooms. These are nearly always ideal images for photographers because they're inherently visually appealing. And okay, this is a pretty standard portrait, but very carefully composed, uh, nicely lit, etc. Compositionally, notice that there's a little cluster of other similar mushrooms in the background there. Where to focus? That's just to show that this fungus is um, occurring in a number of places in this woodland. Why is that? Is it because of the way the spores were spreading or whatever else? But there's also a bramble stem in there, which kind of interferes with the effect. You see the line here of this this stem coming down there and, and going through. So whilst it's out of focus, it's still a little bit distracting. Um, so in sort of in technical photographic terms, it makes it a little bit flawed. Um, when I took the picture on the day, I didn't actually notice that, but it might raise the issue then, actually, you know, I could fix that in a jiffy in Photoshop, but should I really do that? And um, again, that's a discussion point about image manipulation. Uh, my view is no, I would not. I should have just been a little bit more careful when I was taking that, that image. Um, so here, more, more, more fungi for you. And this really, the message here is just when you're out and about, be observant wherever you are. I was on holiday when I took this one, so not in, not in work mode, walking along the cliffs in Cornwall. But then I saw this, this mushroom growing out of this cow pat. And um, by taking this and putting it in my stock pile, now I have an image that I can use to talk about mushrooms, about grasslands, about grazing with the dung, about nutrient cycling because the fungus is decomposing that dung and will be making nutrients available to the grass, etc. etc. Um, again, composed so that the mushroom is offset from the center. And there's a little bit of counterbalance here, a bit of dung in the foreground. So that puts this linear, this diagonal line across again. So it just helps visually to make this, this appealing in that sort of sense. So always have your camera with you, always keep your eyes open and you'll be able to grab some images that again will be useful for, for in all sorts of circumstances. And then another fungal one, just uh, amazing in the sense, this is the maize gill fungus that grows on trees. This is what it looks like underneath. Spores come pouring out from, from here. You know, most fungi have these radial gills. So this has this beautiful structure. Um, of, of this maze-like formation. Um, again, a little bit of artistic license here. I've carefully differentially focused this so that the edges are out of focus. So it kind of looks like coral underwater. And again, you, know, you can pick that up as a theme in terms of the similarity in, in, in shapes and forms that nature creates in different sorts of circumstances and why might that be. Um, so again, I have a, a, a strong interest in pattern formation um, in systems as well. So, and whatever subject you've got, if you look at it carefully and think, you can do very creative things with them um, as well. Um, so the, I think the last, the last fungal picture, um, whilst many of the images I've shown you have been taken with high-end cameras and high-end equipment and so forth, um, it's not necessarily needed to take great shots. Okay? Good photography is all about composition and knowing your equipment. So here's one of my more recent fungal portraits complete with the fairy light in the background, that backlit there. This is taken with my iPhone. So the iPhone camera is quite remarkable, um, no doubts. Um, and it can take images like this, which might you know, convince people it was another sort of instrument. But if you know your equipment and you know how to compose, etc., etc., you can create really striking things like this um, from the outset. So that's the other reason to know your equipment is that it allows you to grab pictures quickly if if circumstance arises um, for that. And I'll give you an example of that in a minute. So let's just move on to a bit more sort of the, the technical equipment type photography. Um, this may be a bit more familiar to people, but again, they this is sort of standard scientific sort of perspective, but they can also be enhanced by careful composition. So it's an example of one where I framed everything here very carefully so that there is an eye-like motif arising from that yellow filter and the microscope objective there. And this is to convey that this is all about observation because what we're observing here actually is this tiny, tiny soil aggregate there, a little piece of the Scottish English border being examined here using a very high resolution 
um, X-ray computer tomography system with, with a microscope lens. So it also means you have to look hard to see this aggregate. I may need to you know, draw your attention to that. Notice that it's framed and in, you know, it's very carefully in the center in this case with a clear background so it can be visible. So you have to look hard to start with, but I can point you in there. But meanwhile, you've sort of visually been picked up by the way this whole image is, um, is fixed. And again, the microscope objective and the drill chuck give you a sense of scale. So I haven't put a scale bar um, in that one. Um, again, I wanted to show you this one, just for personal reasons. It's one of my earliest scientific images. It shows nitrogen fixing nodules on the roots of bean plants, fasciolus bean plants. Um, which I did as my undergraduate project at, at university. And um, I took this in my student room one evening using an angle poise lamp, desk lamp for illumination, and my girlfriend's black skirt for to give a guaranteed nice black background. So again, you know, wherever you are, you can contrive stuff to give you the circumstances to get these really nice images. Again, notice the composition here is just rotated the roots around a bit so you could see the nodules here on this side, but there are none on this side to show that nodules don't occur on all the roots, but visually I have this arch appearing there to, to, to counterbalance that. And then to come right up to date, here's an image I took this morning on a not dissimilar theme, so that's my photographic life for you, where this is showing um, the, this is unashamedly technical record photo of soil adhering to wheat roots, something I'm currently studying in a BBSRC funded grant. And I put this in as an example to show you how a scale bar in the image can be put there so that it can be used in the shot and it looks visually appealing and it's satisfying. But equally, I can crop it out if needed and I can stick the other scale bar in underneath. Um, and again, you can do that using Photoshop or PowerPoint or whatever else. But again, whilst it's, you know, it's unashamedly technical record, it's still visually appealing because of the way I've got the parallel lines there. I've used a coloured background that is complementary to that allows the contrast with the roots and the soil to be to be seen at the same time. And then here's the reason why you need to have, know your equipment so that if a, a chance shot should arise you can grab it quickly um, and also it's always good to have a bit of humour around as well for depending on the depending on the occasion. Um, so not deliberately posed, but just an example of a colleague actually getting well stuck into his, his soil sampling. And I was able to grab that and then you can use that for, for, um, for some humour or whatever else and a good, a good stock image for, um, for soil science talks. And then, uh, so again, traditionally, I don't know, you know sort of the way to end a talk is with the sunset over the, the Ar sunset over the glacier if you're a, an Arctic uh, biologist, Arctic scientist. I'm a soil scientist, so I'm just finishing here with a whole range of photo microscopic images. So this is through the microscope of some work that I've, that I've been doing over the years to finish with. And I'm happy to pick up um, any questions um, with you, as I say, both now um, or in the, in the future. Just looking at the screen here, I've got um, a question coming in about do I have many cameras? Or are all these images taken with a very smart camera? Well, I, I kind of answered that already in the sense that yes and no. So some of those are taken with a very smart camera um, and some are taken with my iPhone. Um, some have been taken with my first digital camera, which was a little 1.4 megapixel thing. Um, again, if you know what you're doing and you know the limitations of your equipment, you can take some quite remarkable images of that. So the key thing is to, is to know your equipment. Um, and with that, then you'll be able to to, to, to rise to almost any, any occasion in that sort of sense. Well, thank you very much, Carl. That was that's, that's really interesting. Have you... Yeah. Uh, okay, um, that's, that's great. Thank you very much. It's certainly given us a lot of top tips to think about. And also, thank you for sharing all the striking images, um, particularly like the one of the fungi. Thank you. Um, I, mean, I think we've, we've learned, you know, the sensor scale and the stock library is very um, important as well in communications terms. You know, having something in your back pocket for many different situations is always good comms. And also for scientific communications, considering the purpose of your photograph and who the audience is, again, you know, we back that up um, all the time. And good photography can help your communications enormously and we always like to work with researchers who give us good photo photographs uh, and so okay. thank you very much the thing yeah. about having your own stock library is it's your copyright you haven't got to go to all that rigmarole of getting copyright. copyright 
<laughs> which can be very expensive as well <laughs> and time consuming. So pleasure. I hope you find it useful. As I say, um, happy to take any questions. Uh, people can email whenever they like. Uh, uh, Thank you. Yes, I mean this is going to go, go online, so people can pick up on it afterwards as well. So um, we can always email in with some questions. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Thank you for attending. Bye. -bye.